City County Planning Commission, please come to order. Ms. Martin, would you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Rich, Commissioner Vitale, Commissioner Balance, Commissioner Clark. Yes. Commissioner Unsold. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert. Yes, Commissioner Gay. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Warren. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Madison. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston. Yes, ma'am. Chair Runner. Yes, ma'am. Everyone's had a chance to review the summary minutes of the September 19th meeting. Are there any corrections to those minutes? No corrections. I'd ask for a motion. I'll move. Thank you. And a second, please. Thank you. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Unsold? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Gay? Ma'am. Commissioner Warren? Ma'am. Commissioner Madison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston? Stain. Chair Runner? Yes, ma'am. Chairman Runner, I request that you order that the Warren County Zoning Ordinance, Subdivision Regulations, and the Comprehensive Plan with all of its elements effective as of this date be introduced as exhibits for each of tonight's hearings. I further request that you order that the staff reports, all attachments together with the Commission's file for each application be introduced as exhibits. Finally, I ask that Ben Peterson, Rachel Hurt, and Monica Ramsey be sworn as witnesses before you and that their oath and qualifications be reflected in the record for each hearing. So ordered, you swear to tell the truth before this commission. Thank you all. Next item is our financial report and we have an audit report tonight. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to say, Ms. Megan, before we introduce the auditor or? Yeah. Okay, we have the auditor with us tonight, Mr. Stephen Thromberry, to give our audit report. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Thromberry with Hensley and Thromberry CPAs. Before we begin, first, I'd like to thank the Commission and Alumnus partner with you and perform the audit for the year ending 630-19. Um, I'll go quickly through some of the highlights of the audit. I'm happy to report we're able to offer a clean and unmodified opinion on the financial statements. Um, what that means is we're, we are not aware of any modifications that need to be made in order for the financial statements to be in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles known as GAAP. The total receipts last year, including surety bond deposits, totaled two and a half million dollars. Disbursements for the year ending June 30, 2019, totaled $1.8 million. This was a net increase in cash of $693,000. The cash at the end of the year, June 30, 19, was $1.9 million, 800,000 of which was in the operating account. The balance 1.1 was in the surety account. There were no new footnotes regarding last year. Um, we'll quickly highlight some of the budgetary comparisons. For the year in June 30, 2019, total receipts last year were $1.7 million for the operating activities, which is a positive variance of $280,000. Total disbursements were $1.5 million, which was a half a million dollars below the budget. It's another positive variance of $500,000. We did review or take into consideration internal control for audit procedures. We did not audit those or offer an opinion, but when those were taken into considerations, we found no material weaknesses to report. So the good news is there's no findings and we have an unmodified opinion. Are there any questions over the financial audit? Questions, and that's always no findings is a good thing, and we thank Ms. Mooney for that. We appreciate all that you do. Uh, no questions, and I'll call for a motion. So move. Thank you accept the audit. Thank you. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Unsold? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert? Commissioner Gay? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Warren? Ma'am. Commissioner Madison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston? Yes, ma'am. Chair Runner? Yes, ma'am. Chairman Runner, may I make a comment, please? Yes. I would like to thank the staff, Megan especially, for all their excellent work in preparing the documents and preparing the records for this audit for it to be such a success. I just want to thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. You're welcome. Second. The next item, the uh, preliminary to subdivision and site development plans. Any questions on those items? No questions. We'll move on to letters of credit and performance bonds. And I'm sure everyone's noticed that you have an amended agenda at your seat tonight that has five items on that agenda. Any questions on those items? No questions. I would call for a motion, please. Move. Thank you. We need a second. Second. 
Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Unsold? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert? Commissioner Gay? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Warren? Ma'am. Commissioner Madison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston? Yes, ma'am. Chair Runner? Yes, ma'am. We do not have any unfinished business, and that brings us for our new business. Uh, first item for public hearing is docket number 2019-06 Bloom, Cave Mill 2 LLC and Cave Mill Station LLC have filed an application for a future land use map amendment on tracts of land containing approximately 11.24 acres located at zero Cave Mill Station Boulevard. That's approximately 290 feet from the beginning of Cave Mill Station Boulevard from mixed use residential to high density residential and also Concerning that same property on docket number 2019-41-ZBG, the applicants have requested a zone change on that same land that would go from highway business and floodplain with the general development plan to RM4 multifamily residential and floodplain with a devel uh, general development plan. And we'll have the staff report from Ms. Ramsey. Thank you, Chair Runner. We had a pre-application conference on July 17th for the properties you see outlined here in yellow. As uh, Chair Runner has already stated, those properties are uh, designated highway business and floodplain over there to the, uh, to the east. They are currently vacant, and uh, as Chair Runner's also stated, uh, they, uh, one thing the applicants are here tonight uh, to request is to amend this future land use map from mixed use residential to high density residential. And so I will bring this up that we can reference as we go along. Uh, the applicants are requesting, uh, along with that future land use map amendment and um, uh, the zone change to uh, RM4 multifamily residential in order to develop the properties with a maximum of 188 multifamily residential units, which would result in a density of 16.73 dwelling units per acre. The property uh, history, properties history, uh, it was originally zoned agriculture, and then they were both rezoned from agriculture to highway business in 2008. The properties um, are designated as mixed-use residential uh, with the request to amend a high-density residential. The proposed RM4 zoning district is listed as a potentially compatible zone in the high-density residential flume designation, and this uh, body should determine if the proposed development is compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, below that, um, on the first page of your staff report, the compatibility with surrounding development. Just wanted to note that uh, staff did note there was a large portion of one of the properties uh, that contains a sinkhole. And I'll come back to the points to consider in just a moment. We'll go on to page two. You see there the, uh, the descriptions of both the mixed-use residential and high-density residential categories. And below that, LU114, which outlines the procedures for amending the future land use map. The applicants supply the following to address that criteria. This property is surrounded with multifamily and commercial uses. Uh, just going on to uh, page three, where your site characteristics review is continued there um, onto the next page. Uh, again, just wanted to point out the sinkhole again, uh, which currently can, uh, also contains a drainage basin and uh, we've already established that part of the uh, properties uh, are, is designated as floodplain. Going below there to site design and compatibility review, uh, the surrounding density, uh, density of the adjacent multifamily development to the south is approximately 17.15 dwelling units per acre. Patio homes in nearby Eaglestone Villa are approximately five dwelling units per acre. The overall density for the multifamily developments in Chandler Park is approximately 21.32 dwelling units per acre and uh, we already established that this proposed density is 16.73 dwelling units per acre. Uh, I'll point out the surrounding architectural features. There's a mixture of uh, commercial and residential structures ranging from one to four stories in height in the area. Building materials, the existing development incorporates a mixture of brick, stone, and vinyl. The facades facing Cave Mill Road are 100% brick. The structures in Chandler Park development across Cave Mill Road incorporate a large percentage of brick, stone, ephus, cement board siding, and other modern masonry materials. Building orientation, right below that, staff recommends that buildings should be oriented to face Cave Mill Station Boulevard. There are a few buildings shown on the preliminary development plan that have a side facade facing Cave Mill Station Boulevard. Uh, below uh, that, I'll just go down. Uh, staff did note that there are sidewalks along Cave Mill Station Boulevard and Cave Mill Road. 
Moving on to page four, you have the traffic impact study language there from the zoning ordinance. The traffic impact study was waived by the Bowling Green Public Works Department. Uh, Bowling Green uh, Public Works requested the addition of, a, uh, of lane lines on Cave Mill Station Boulevard where it intersects with Cave Mill Road, which the applicants did agree to in their development plan conditions. So with that, I'll go through the development plan conditions right now. Number one, all new utilities will be located underground. Number two, the subject property will be developed with a maximum of 188 dwelling units as generally shown on Exhibit A with no single building containing more than 24 dwelling units. Number three, no building shall exceed three stories. Number four, improvements to the property shall be constructed of at least 50% brick, masonry, wood, glass, stucco, or other modern, similar modern masonry materials. Plain face blocks shall not be used. Number five, the property shall be developed with an internal and external parking and traffic system. The system shall include curb and gutter. The system shall include four foot sidewalks located at each of the buildings. Number six, the property will be developed with a mail, community mailbox system and uniform street lights of metal, fiberglass, and composite metals. Number seven, additional lane lines will be added at the end of Cave Mill Station Boulevard, where it intersects with Cave Mill Road per the, requ per the request of the City of Bowling Green Public Works in lieu of a traffic impact study. Number eight, access points will be coordinated with the Bowling Green Public Works Department. And number nine, any sinkholes on the property will be addressed per the City of Bowling Green regulations. And so I will go on now to our Focus 2030 category review. Staff reviewed 18 items, uh, 10 of which are up to you all to determine, uh, including LU114 uh, that's included in that count, which is about the future land use map amendment. So the proposal may comply with LU111 and 112 if deemed compatible with the surrounding area, if the Flume Amendment is approved, and if the Planning Commission determines that the proposal is compatible with the area and complies with LU113. The proposal may comply with LU2 and LU21 if the uh, Planning Commission deems the proposal to be a high quality development that includes design standards tailored to preserve the character of the area. A uh, proposal may comply with 211, which encourages increased open space. Um, we'll note that their development plan, uh, which we've got pulled up here, depicts two dog parks and picnic area, as well as green space uh, in the development, a pool and outdoor activity space. There is no requirement, however, that the applicants construct the open space as shown. LU231, uh, uh, or excuse me, LU252. Uh, the Planning Commission should determine if this is a, the proposed infill development is compatible with the surrounding area. And uh, down at the bottom of your review there, the proposal may comply with HN1, HN12, and HN13. Uh, it's up to this body if uh, this infill development will, is a compatible infill development that will maintain or improve the existing character and pattern of development within the area, and if it will strengthen the existing area. And finally, uh, HN21, HN4, this body should determine if the location of the planned development is suitable for the proposed housing type and if the proposed development is believed to enhance the array of housing options available in the area. So I will go back to page one and we'll go over the points to consider. This body should consider if the argument provided by the applicants to amend the flume meets the criteria outlined in LU114 of the comprehensive plan. If the flume amendment is approved, the proposal would be consistent with the flume and high density residential category. The proposed development generally complies with the majority of the site characteristics review criteria, and the proposed general development plan complies with the majority of the review criteria for site design and compatibility and meets the minimum requirements of the zoning ordinance. So that's all for the staff report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and the applicants are here. I'm sure they'd be happy to address any questions too. Ms. Monica, yes, ma'am. On the park, when you were speaking earlier, you said 100% brick. Is that you said across the street beside it? Where did you say there was 100% brick? When this has the general development plan conditions of only 50%. Right, that was uh, that was for. Go back to the. Uh, that was for the the ones um, behind this one to the south. Oh, it's based. Yes, that's correct. Yes. And this may be a question for the applicant. Um, the general the the uh, general, general development plan and conditions 
indicate 50% brick, as uh, Sandy indicated, but the elevations indicate 100%. Um, are these meant to be a, a representation of what's to be built there? That would probably be a better question for the applicant, okay. Commissioner Graham. Thank yep. you. Monica, the other, question, the other thing you, you mentioned, uh, I know we're showing the pool and clubhouse and activity area, but they're not required to do it, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yep. Other questions before we hear from the applicant? Anything else? Thank you, ma'am. We'll hear from the applicant. If you'd state your name and address for us, please. Thad Lucas, 555 Dunbarton Avenue. And you swear to tell the truth. I do. Thank yes. you. Thank you. And I believe there were some questions. Oh. Well, yeah. uh, I think the first thing is, is the plan to build a clubhouse pool and activity area? That is the plan, yes. So Obviously, we have to go through the engineering to see what all we can sure. design, so but that is the plan, yes. Could we put that into the <clears throat> binding elements? Yes, we want to make sure there's plenty of green space, so that would guarantee us that you're going to add the green space as you show. If you'd state your name, sir. Hunter Thompson. And you swear to tell the truth before this commission. What's Do your we address? Need an address? What's your address? We're okay. okay. My address? Mm -hmm. For, uh, 322 Frederick Street. Thompson Owens. Owens. Owensboro, Kentucky. Would we be to put that into the binding elements? Yes, sir. I don't believe that he's the applicant or the property owner to he, be able to swear to that. He's Cave Mill. LLC. James Cook signed for Cave Mill LLC. Yeah, who would ask that? Now, Tommy Thompson signed. There's, another, Tommy page. There's Thompson. another page over here. There's oh, applicant yeah. certification. James Cook signed for the owner of the property, but the developers. That's what I mean, as the owner of the property. Both will so have he to can, sign. He's the only one that can actually. Both would have to sign the, the, the development plan conditions. Both have to sign the applicant and the property owner. So both have to swear to it. Oh, okay. I know, I saw him. <laughs> and your name and address, please, sir. James Cook, 177 South Wind Drive, Bowling Green. And you swear to tell the truth. I do. Thank you, sir. Now, the development uh, plan conditions, the addition. I think. Okay to put the, uh, the what, what's depicted on the, uh, the clubhouse, the pool, and activity area. On your um, drawings, you show 100% brick, but in your conditions, you only say 50% brick. Can we get that 50% raised to a little bit higher amount to make sure that it goes around with the rest of the surroundings? And if I may add to Sandy, Sandy's comment there, um, it, it's 50% cementitious is what's shown on the elevation. So you've got some, you've got some, uh, a little bit of hardy plank on there and you've also got like some uh, like stone uh, mountain stone on there as well I think what we're trying to do is make sure it's not vinyl exactly right yeah I mean, so if, if you're gonna do what's on the elevations I, I think all we need to do is change the uh, uh, development uh, uh, plan conditions if that's your intent and uh, and that fixes it for us 100% okay Hundred percent, Sandy. It'll be brick, hardy. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's make sure it's a hundred percent brick or other cementation materials. You like that? I do. <laughs> Tell that one. He probably can. <laughs> no. Any other questions for the applicant? Commissioners? Have you all looked at the sinkhole? Is that going to be it's in the flood doable? Zone. It is all in the flood yeah, zone. There's nothing on the actual building area. It's back over in the, in the flood zone area. Okay. This is just me being curious due to the location of that property. What is in the, what flood zone is located on that property? The flood zone is okay. There's a, there's a, there's a flood zone on that property? 
Yes, it's behind Thompson or Thompson. It's behind uh, Thornton's furniture. Is it a retention basin? It's a retention basin. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions before I open it up to the audience? No questions. Do we have any questions from anyone in the audience concerning this application? Do we have any opposition to these requests? No questions, no opposition. Then I will call for a motion. Make the motion to approve the proposed future land use map amendment docket number 2019 Flume. Based upon the testimony and documents presented in the public hearing, the proposed Flume amendment has mm -hmm. met the criteria to amend the Flume as outlined in LU114 in the comprehensive plan. Further request mm -hmm. this motion mm -hmm. includes a summary of evidence testimony presented by the mm -hmm. witnesses at this public hearing. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Volkert. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Gay. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Warren. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Unsold. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Madison. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Commissioner Houston. Yes, ma'am. Chair Renner. Yes, ma'am. The motion carried, and now we need to act on the zone change request. So I'll call for that motion, please. Make the motion to approve the proposed zoning map amendment together with and condition upon a general development plan docket number 2019 41ZBG based upon the testimony and documents presented in this public hearing. The proposed zoning map amendment is consistent with the adopted focus 2030 comprehensive plan as demonstrated by its compliance with the objectives and actions items presented in the staff report. Therefore, the proposed zoning map amendment is in agreement with the adopted comprehensive plan. Further, I request this motion include a summary of evidence and testimony presented by the witnesses at this public hearing. Second. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Madison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Warren? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Unsold? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert? Commissioner Gay? Yes, ma'am. Chair Runner? Yes, ma'am. The motion carried. Our recommendation will be for approval. Thank you all. The next item, docket number 2019-42-Z County, Mr. Patel and L.S. Jr. and Sheila Cherry have filed an application to rezone a tract of land containing approximately 0 0.7027 acre located at the corner of Scottsville Road, Mount Lebanon Road, and Alberton Road from agriculture to general business with a general development plan. And we'll have the staff report from Ms. Hurt. Thank you, Chair Runner. We had a pre-application conference on August 16th for the parcel outlined in yellow. As you mentioned, it's kind of sandwiched in between Scottsville Road, Alberton Road, and Mount Lebanon Road there at the historic crossroads of the Alberton community. And the current zoning of the property is agriculture with the current use of the property being vacant. The future land use designation for the property is Rural Village, and I'm going to read that description for you. It's on page two. The Rural Village land use designation is intended to provide for the continued vitality of the existing commercial and residential mixed use areas found in the smaller rural agricultural centers throughout Warren County. The Rural Village brings a sense of community and identification to the surrounding rural areas with an emphasis on providing essential goods and services to rural residents but is not intended as employment designation for urban residents. Neighborhood scale commercial uses are encouraged as pockets of mixed use developments and commercial uses should be limited in size and scale, less than 10,000 square feet, and only allow uses permitted in the zones outlined in the future land use category table. When proposed as part of a mixed use development, commercial components should only comprise no more than 10% of any such development and standalone commercial development should not exceed more than 25% of any contiguous area designated as rural village. Limited moderate density multifamily uses may, may be appropriate in some areas if limited in size and scale, and compatibility should be assessed by applying the policies in LU113 in conjunction with a general development plan and by applying specific policies found in focal point plans, area plans, corridor studies, or any other plan created and approved by the Planning Commission. So moving on to the layout, lot size, and setbacks section of the site characteristics review, you can see that this is the proposed layout of the site. The proposed use is a gas station. You can see the building is proposed uh, along the southern property line here with parking uh, in front of the building here and then along the side in this general location. And then there are also four fuel pumps proposed out front here. And that would allow for service of up to two vehicles at a time. So total, you could serve eight vehicles with the four pumps that are shown there uh, toward the front portion of the property here. 
Touching on water adequacy, the property is served by Warren County Water District and is not currently served or provided with adequate water pressure to meet the minimum fire protection requirements for commercial use. If this application is approved, upgrades to the existing infrastructure will be required before any commercial use could occur on the property. Under wastewater adequacy, staff has noted that the property is located within 2,000 feet of public sanitary sewer and will be required to be served by sewer if this application is approved. Under site design and compatibility review, I'm going to jump back to the land use map here. Um, the surrounding area is mainly comprised of single family residential and agricultural uses. There are also a couple of public institutional uses and public uses in the area as well, as well as several vacant tracks, and there are a couple of commercial uses also located in the vicinity. I'm going to skip on to the area-specific policy review. Um, a lot of the site design and compatibility items are also touched, <laughs> touched on in this section, so and rather than repeat them, I'm just going to touch on them in the area-specific policy review, which refers to the Scottsville Road Corridor Study, which was adopted by the Planning Commission in June of 2015. So, number one, the first recommendation that was evaluated <coughs> by staff is a requirement that all development visible from Scottsville Road be designed in a way to appear to face Scottsville Road, regardless of the location of the driveway access and parking, um, and as you can see from the proposed site layout, the building is not proposed to be oriented towards Scottsville Road and would not comply with this recommendation. Um, I'm going to touch on number two, which relates to an underground utility requirement. The applicants did agree to this in the development plan conditions, and so the, the proposal does comply with this recommendation. Number three, a recommendation that all new non-residential development have limited access and or spacing requirements. And the applicants did commit in development plan condition seven that the property would be developed with one entrance along Alvaton Road, which would be approved by the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. So the proposal does comply with this recommendation. You can see that one access point is proposed right here. Number four, a building material requirement for both residential and non-residential development for for facades facing Scottsville Road and possibly all roadways. The applicants committed in development plan condition number four that facades visible from the road shall be constructed with at least 70% brick, stone masonry, or cementitious material, architectural metal panels utilizing concealed fasteners, glass, or other modern masonry material, and that the use of plain face or split face blocks shall be prohibited. The Planning Commission should determine compliance with this recommendation. Number five, a requirement that all new signage be monument style with a lower square footage cap as well as a prohi prohibition on LED signs. The applicants did not commit to signage with a lower square footage cap and did not address LED signs and does not comply with this recommendation. And for reference, the zoning ordinance allows freestanding signage in the proposed general business zone up to 30 feet in height with a maximum sign face area of 150 square feet. Next, number six, a requirement that either no parking be allowed in the building setback along Scottsville Road or to have the parking to the rear of the building as long as the rear is not Scottsville Road. And as you can see from the proposed site plan, there is no parking located in the building setback along Scottsville Road, but the majority of the parking is shown in front of the building. So the proposal would comply with the recommendation about uh, keeping parking outside the setback along Scottsville Road, but would not comply with the recommendation for the parking to be located to the rear of the building. Next, number seven, a requirement that there shall be no outdoor storage within X amount of feet from Scottsville Road. And the applicants agreed in development plan condition six that there shall be no outdoor storage within 60 feet of the right of way of Scottsville Road and generally complies with this recommendation. Number eight, a requirement that all roof level electrical transformers, heat and air conditioning equipment and similar facilities be screened from public view. And the applicants did agree in development plan condition five that all roof level <coughs> electrical transformers, heat and air conditioning equipment and similar facilities be screened. So the proposal does comply with this recommendation. And then last, an open space and or green space or greenways requirement for new development. The applicants did not address open space or green space and the proposal does not comply with this recommendation. And so, as you can see, there were nine recommendations uh, that were applicable and that were evaluated from the Scottsville Road Corridor Study. And the staff found that there were uh, four recommendations 
that the proposal complied with and that there were three that the proposal did not comply with and that there were two that uh, should be determined by this planning commission if, if those are in compliance or not. With that, I will move on to page five, which outlines the development plan conditions. I think I mentioned the majority of these uh, with the exception of a couple. So I'm gonna jump to number two, um, which states that the proposed structure along with any accessory structures shall not exceed 3,500 square feet and that the maximum building height would be 28 feet. Number three addresses prohibited uses on the property and prohibits adult entertainment or any sale, rental, or display of pornography or adult books, bingo parlor, pawn shop, tattoo parlor, <coughs> bar or lounge, except in connection with a restaurant deriving more than 50% of its income from food sales, parking that is not accessory to a specific use, used car sales, except in conjunction with a new car dealership, any establishment conducting games of chance or other, char other than charitable gaming, which it would also exclude the sale of lottery tickets inc incidental to the business. And I believe the remaining development plan conditions were already addressed in the Scottsville Road Corridor Study section of the staff report. Next, Focus 2030 category review. Staff evaluated 15 items from the, the Focus 2030 comprehensive plan and found that the application clearly complies with five of these items. Compliance with the remaining 10 items should be evaluated and determined by the Planning Commission. So I'm gonna to touch on those 10 items. I'm gonna skip over the five that we found to be in compliance. Uh, but of course, if you have questions about any of those, be sure to let me know. So first, LU113, which looks at compatibility. Next, LU2, which looks at quality of development and character preservation. Next, we have LU252, which evaluates compatibility uh, of infill development. Moving on to page six, LU2.8 and LU2.8.1, which consider the Scottsville Road Corridor Study recommendations. Next, LU2.9, which looks at protection of Alvaton's rural character. The Planning Commission <coughs> should determine if the proposed <coughs> development protects Alvaton's rural <coughs> center and if the proposed development is compatible with the area. Next, NCR 2.4 and NCR 2.4.3, which acknowledge preservation and enhancement of Alvaton's Rural Center. The Planning Commission should determine if the proposed development will preserve and enhance Alvaton's Rural Village Center, and if the proposed development will be compatible with the area, and if it will contribute to the historic character of the Alvaton community. And next, NCR 2.4.1, the proposal may not comply with this item as the development is proposed in an area where adequate water pressure and flow to meet minimum fire protection requirements for a commercial use does not currently exist. The Planning Commission should determine if the proposed development will result in premature development pressure on the countryside. And last, ED1, which examines diversification of the local economy. The Planning Commission should determine if the proposed development will help to diversify the local economy. So with that, I'm gonna jump back to the points to consider on page one. So first, staff has noted that the proposal is consistent with the future land use map and rural village category. The proposed <laughs> development does comply with the majority of the site characteristics review criteria. The proposed development plan also complies with some of the review criteria for site design and meets the minimum requirements in the zoning ordinance. The Planning Commission should determine if the proposed development is compatible with the surrounding area and the Alvaton community. And last, the proposed development complies with some of the recommendations from the Scottsville Road Corridor Study, but does not conform to the recommendations relating to building orientation, signage, location of parking, and open space. I think that's it for the staff report, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I have questions. Uh, requirement. Number one, the building is not proposed to be oriented towards Scottsville Road and does not comply with this recommendation. I'm sure the applicants can answer that, but. Sure, yeah. As you can see here, the front door, um, and the applicants can confirm this, I believe the entrance is here on the corner of the building here. So it doesn't comply. Proposed? Correct, it does not comply with that recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Clark, what was your question? Do you have any pictures of what they're proposing for the building at we, all? We do not. Okay. Where is, um, 
Where is water and sewer currently located? The uh, water is currently available. It's just not at an adequate pressure to meet the fire protection requirements. And the applicants may want to um, address this, and they may be able to do it a little bit better than I can. Um, and I may get the term wrong, but it's my understanding that there's some sort of, I think what is referred to as a pressure release valve that would have to be installed that would help to get the pressure up to the minimum flow that's required for commercial use. So it's not a line capacity issue? Uh, it's not a, a water line size issue, as you understand it? As I understand it, yes. Okay. And Sewer stops at the Alvin School? It does, um, and then if, let me jump back to the map here. If you recall, uh, this property was rezoned recently, so sewer will be extended in the near future. It's within 2,000 feet and would have to connect. Sure. Yes. Okay. Other questions before we hear from the applicant? Nothing else, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, if we could hear from the applicant, please. you'd state your name and dress for us, please. Your name and address. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Yes. You, your name and address. Abhipin Patel. My address is 1012 Cumberland Ridgeway, Bowling Green, Kentucky, 348. And you swear to tell the truth. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there was a question concerning the building orientation may be able to help with that. It will we'll swear you in, your yes, name and address. Mm -hmm. Jace Caldwell, 1015 Shive Lane. And you swear to tell the truth. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the water pressure goes, um, after talking with Warren County Water, uh, all that we need to do is put in a pressure re release valve, and all that does is gonna tie in two existing water lines and get the pressure up to the appropriate uh, 400 gallons per minute, or 250. 600? Man, I'm losing it here. Um, and actually, uh, let's see if I can go back. If you look, that right there, that is a Breckenridge subdivision. Uh, they're putting in some single family lots over there and they actually have to do that anyway. So either our, we will have to do it, but mo more than likely it'll be put in by the time we get to that point of needing to develop it. And then as far as the building orientation goes, um, it was very difficult as far as site layout. Um, the only frontage we actually have on Scottsville Road is right there. And with the setbacks, we've got three uh, front yard setbacks and it made it very difficult to be able to put the building facing Scottsville Road. Um, if you were coming from Bowling Green, it would appear to face Scottsville Road. It's kind of catty corner, but we couldn't make it just parallel with Scottsville Road without losing the majority of his pumps. So, so you, uh, you do not own the adjacent property if we're facing this map to the left? Um, this right here mm -hmm. is just a uh, parcel that the transportation cabinet owns. It was severed when they widened Scottsville Road or put Scottsville Road in. Okay, so, um, if I may, let's uh, let's explore. Do, do we have any elevations to work from here? Okay. Um, Without elevations, it's going to be tough for us to determine what style of building this is going to be. Is it going to be brick? Since it's not going to face Scottsville Road, you're going to have to have more than one side with nicer building materials. Name and address, please. Ross Dinwiddie, P.O. Box 743, Franklin, Kentucky. And you tell the truth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, all the convenience stores we've done for Mr. Patel so far have been 100% uh, brick, stone, uh, aluminum panel, or marble on the 100% of the exterior. Um, to properly hide the um, equipment on the roof, 
we were likely looking at a flat roof with a, with a uh, parapet wall versus a slope roof, uh, but that could not be 100% determined. So we may have a shingle roof versus a flat roof with a parapet. If it's a parapet uh, coming from Scottsville, there's a good chance you would see that equipment and we would do our best to hide it. The best bet being a slope roof. So that's why we committed to 70% instead of 100. As far as walls go, 100% masonry or aluminum panels. Free to change that? Yeah, I mean, it's right. The, in the past, he, like, he prefers a shingle roof. That would be the only thing that's not masonry. Uh, would basically be like a mansard to hide the equipment. Uh, but we, I mean, we could easily commit to 100% masonry or, or aluminum. Can I ask a question, and I may have misunderstood what you just said. Um, you said if you're coming from Scottsville, you would see the roof level equipment? If you're coming from Scottsville, you're, you would at an angle see the back of the building. Um, but you, you could actually see the roof mounted equipment from, if you were coming from if Scottsville? If it were a flat roof, a traditional flat roof with uh, parapet walls. But so we would avoid that, and the easiest way oh, to okay. avoid that is to uh, is to put a slope roof on it. Okay, the, 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 I was just asking right. because the development plan right. conditions say that it would be screened. So I was just yes, making sure screened. that I right. understood that correctly. Right. Thank you. Uh, we could we could start on design any time. We really wanted to get through the to make sure we were had kind of had a green light. Here's the here's the tough part for us. Um, there are a number of things that don't fit. But if we were able to see the elevations and we could talk to you specifically about where we're going to put these building materials, how it's going to be oriented, uh, what the view is going to be from Scottsville Road, um, that would help us a lot. Uh, we can tr we, uh, it's possible in the plan uh, conditions to fill in some of this, but it's very difficult for us to visually see that. And I think you, it appears that you have a pretty good view of what's going to happen here. You just haven't developed elevations yet. Is that accurate? Correct. Would you be opposed to tabling this and coming back uh, to us with elevations that would help us with this process? It's a compatibility issue. We just want to make sure that we're moving with, um, so that we understand what's going to be we're there. Not trying, we're not trying to send you on a wild goose chase. <clears throat> yeah, but we'd like to know what the sign's going to look like, and, and there's just so many things that are not met. Um, yet, I mean, even to this evening, we could show as typical convenience store he typically builds uh, because I, we would we know that they they both fit the area um, and it would be agreed um, that they're 100 percent brick stone or aluminum panel uh, very high in materials but the he would not be interested in extending the schedule out another month the contract on the land would expire and well, we'll have a meeting in october four weeks we've, we've canceled our next meeting on the 17th so it'd be november 7th Ensure, we basically, because we have three facades, essentially three streets we face, we're designing the building with uh, spandrel glass and um, nicer materials to have three facades, essentially. I think um, it goes back to question simply, number one. Uh, the building is not proposed to be oriented towards Scottsville Road, and you're saying the door needs to be where you, that way. And I think what the commissioners are asking is for the elevation and potentially a redesign of how the building faces. The building door cannot face Scottsville Road in this property work. So let me j jump in here too. So in the pre-application meeting, we discussed this item at length and we discussed that even that triangle still owned by Commonwealth of Kentucky that is technically not part of the right of way we would still consider road frontage so that so they do have that length to be able right. to face the building as well the second piece we discussed in the pre-application conference is we uh, uh, in order to orient a building on Scottsville Road and we've done this on other projects was just to put a facade entrance facing Scottsville Road it may not be the main entrance 
but it would just have an entrance facing Scottsville Road. So it would still give the appearance that the building is facing Scottsville Road, but the main entrance could still be on the corner. So we did discuss so you, you both feel, of those you items. you feel that's in compliance? Compliant. No, it is not currently. I'm just saying we discussed options of maybe putting a entry facade uh, or, or something facing that that triangle piece facing Scottsville Road. That look like an entrance, but not usable. Correct. You could you could wrap a sidewalk in around from from parking spot one, I guess it is, around to that uh, uh, Got you. that southwest side. We would. We're already planning on having windows in that side anyway. That's, I mean, so it would not be a neglected facade by any means, but uh, we could add that to the report as well. But. Still delay the process a month. The, the contract on the land will expire. So we would not be interested in that route. We also have concerns about you don't address any green space or any kind of, I mean, I'm not sure what you are going to put around there. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't address that. You don't address how you're going to cover up the roof element, you know, the, the materials and the signage. Those are all concerns of ours that we can't picture without seeing some kind of elevation. We'll give them just a minute to, to discuss. That would push the meeting date back to early December, correct? November. The, the final. The minutes would have to be signed the second meeting of November. Um, it would not meet because. But, it, it, but the county could possibly take this before the minutes are signed, so we could probably get it in uh, the first reading by the end of November. So the first reading would be the end of November, and the second and final reading would be the first of December, as long as fiscal court has their, their meetings. If I'm understanding you correctly, December 1st would be the day, December 2nd, they could close. Am I, as okay. far as it would be approved, if, if you guys decided, I just, they're trying to work it out whether or not they're going to table it. I can't speak. That's the date. Uh, fiscal court has, is, usually meets the first and third Friday of every month, but they have been known to change their schedule, um, especially during holidays. So they... What it, whenever they have their first meeting in December, I feel confident that they that could be the second and final reading. But I, I unfortunately, I, I can't answer that question. Fully December 1st. Yeah. Tentatively, uh, November 15th would be first reading. That's if that meeting, fiscal court meeting schedule holds. Uh, and then December 6th would be the second and final reading assuming everything goes as planned. Contract expire. I don't know the exact date, but it was essentially whenever it was fully approved the next day or something. I mean, it was very soon there. He's on a time crunch, unfortunately. So uh, they're willing to extend the contract to uh, the December 8th. And so which means we'll come back to the next hearing with um, a couple of renderings and um, we'll, we can address the green space and the signage. Okay, so if it's... And the orientation. The right, with the, with the renderings, we'll... we'll yes. uh, but we can tell you, with, it will not change between now and then. If the front door faces Scottsville Road, the, it does not work. 
You the can't only get the change, bike. though, that at my understanding, the only change you need to make, you already have glass on, let's call it the left elevation. Right. If you add a door there, on the, even on the front left corner, and put a sidewalk around, uh, and dress that as an elevation, it doesn't actually necessarily have to be your main entrance, but it will, it will appear to be an entrance from Scottsville Road, and now you've met the requirement. Right, right. Okay. Most everything you've told us verbally fits if, if we just address these all uh, as we move through. That's a uh, request uh, if we could get that uh, at least uh, the Wednesday prior to so we can actually put it in their packets so they can review it prior to the meeting. That would be wonderful. What day would that be? So it's the applicant's request that we table this until our next meeting. So we'll need a motion to that effect if the commissioners are in favor. So moved. Thank you, and we'll need a second. Second. And what will that date be? November 7th. Yes. November the Apologize. 7th. We will not have to advertise because we're tabling it. Correct. Yes. correct. That's correct. We will not, but we usually, if there's a whole month, we'll, yeah. we'll do a, a voluntary one because I haven't done add-in letters for November 7th, so we'll do it voluntarily. Well, we have the motion and we have it seconded so commissioner clark yes commissioner unsold yes ma'am commissioner graham yes ma'am commissioner volkert commissioner gay yes, ma'am commissioner warren yes, ma'am commissioner madison yes, ma commissioner houston yes ma'am chair runner yes ma'am the motion carried and so we will continue this application on november the 7th yes go ahead sir yes everybody understand what happened? Does anybody have any questions on what we just did? We'll be, we're going to suspend this public hearing and we'll continue <coughs> it on uh, November 7th. We do the signs. And we'll, we'll, we'll update the signs and when we get the information, we'll put it on the website so the public <coughs> has a chance to review that. But if you're interested in this application, come back, come back on the 7th and we'll, we'll uh, continue the hearing. Thank you all. And that brings us to new business, Mr. Peterson. <coughs> so at your, uh, at your seats tonight, you had a memo uh, that we addressed to both the personnel committee and uh, of course the entire planning commission body. Uh, kind of gotten a little time crunch here on a, on a, on a hiring of our GIS position. Uh, we've been trying to hire someone for the position of GIS technician for the past couple of months. Um, so we have found someone and we would like to try to get them in before our next planning commission meeting on November 7th. So what we're asking you to do is uh, review that uh, tonight. Uh, we had approximately 15 applications. Uh, we narrowed that applicant pool based on qualifications down to six uh, candidates. Uh, we did uh, have an interview team of uh, Kyle Bearden, who's the GIS manager for City of Bowling Green, and Nikki Kohler, who's the assistant director of Warren County Public Works, and then myself and uh, Megan Mooney. Uh, we had uh, interviewed four candidates. Uh, two of those st uh, stood out. We had one excellent candidate uh, who has uh, at least uh, uh, verbally agreed to, to terms, uh, but we weren't able to uh, do all we needed to do to bring that recommendation to you uh, uh, tonight, complete recommendation to you tonight with all those uh, details uh, nailed down. So we're, what we're uh, wanting to do is uh, present this candidate to you for GIS technician and uh, see if uh, you all are okay to authorize staff to uh, proceed with the hiring of that selected candidate, but within that established salary range, we don't have that exact salary to present to you tonight. We still gotta work those details out but we would, only, we would still be bound by that starting salary range that's already been established. So be happy to entertain any questions or uh, if we need an executive session to, to answer any questions, we will be happy to entertain that. But otherwise, uh, ask for a motion and, and please to recommend that candidate to you tonight. Thank you, sir. Questions? Mm -hmm. Questions? No questions, then. Okay. We need is the motion. 
I move to authorize staff to proceed with the hiring of the selected candidate and negotiate terms not to exceed the established starting salary range. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Unsold? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Graham? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Volkert? Yes, Commissioner Gay? Ma'am. Commissioner Warren? Ma'am. Commissioner Madison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Houston? Yes, ma'am. Chair Runner? Yes, ma'am. The motion carried. Do we have any other business? Nothing else. Meetings adjourned. Thank you all.